TJNet.tv is on the air. We are streaming on Facebook. We're streaming on Twitter. We're streaming on YouTube. We are live in the chat room. Recording is on. Jake McCandless is standing by in the green room. So, let's switch to Studio 6 in 5, 4, 3, 2, Welcome to PJNet.TV for an exciting Tuesday night. Gosh, we've got the, uh, in wrestling they called it the card. You know, the people that are scheduled to appear. <laughs> uh, well, we're not going to have a wrestling match tonight, but we are going to grapple uh, with something that is, in fact, very serious. Or, maybe it isn't. End time expert Jake McCandless is here. And, you know, normally, uh, you know, Jake, I, I'm not too hip about talking end times here at PJNet.TV. You're... It, uh, but you've got my uh, attention because the coronavirus has. Hey, how's your stock of toilet paper? You got enough butt wipe to what? Is, I'm, what, what? I am concerned. I, I'm late to the party. I didn't know it was. I didn't believe what I was hearing. So I am concerned. Uh, we're we we're, every time we see some, we're getting some right now. I am concerned. I I do <laughs> not know I can what think of the worst thing to happen in the run out of toilet paper. What defense is toilet paper against a virus, may I ask? I have no idea. Isn't it crazy? I mean, it, why? Uh, you know, uh, when, when it snows, at least here in the south, it's uh, get all the milk and bread, and then I guess the virus is toilet paper. I don't get it. I, I, I get the Lysol. I get the face mask. But, yeah, uh, yeah I don't know the toilet paper. It does not, you know, uh, in, we're going to get to your, your article in a minute, which I found rather interesting. Uh, where was that published? Uh, is that was I'd never last heard of that. week. Yes, it went. Yes, yeah, that was week. March fourth, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from Is uh, Israel Islam in the End Times. It's a site out of Australia, and uh, but the you know, worldwide, uh, and actually probably America's the, the largest, of course, readership. But uh, yeah, so I do commentary on there. Uh, my my focus is, it's it's all end time related, Middle East centric. Uh, but my, my focus is on us preparing our hearts now and, and then. And, of course, that overlaps with some end-time stuff at, at, with that. So, uh, But, of course, I mean, you can't be – right now, the, the hot topic, of course, everywhere is the coronavirus. Well, it, in your article, you know, you, you say that you don't really think of this as an end-time event. Uh, it is, however, a test of faith. And then I start seeing all this stuff on social media where they're running out of toilet paper. My faith in humanity – definitely went down it is the, the fighting i mean it's like black friday fighting <laughs> uh and, and that's what, what my my purpose with that article was and, and uh I, I was really surprised you were gonna let the end time type uh theme slide here tonight uh and come in there and and i when you start talking end times everybody's got a uh, a view and an opinion and those things and but i, I did uh, address that that there is when we you read in the the account of what the Olivet discourse you see in Matthew twenty four, see in Luke, you see in Mark, uh, it does talk about pestilence in the Luke account, uh, and then do in Revelation six you get this uh, talking about diseases uh, with the pale horse that comes out of those four horsemen, uh, but in each of those cases that's a progression and that's later on, uh, and so there's some things. When you're talking about that specific end time event, there's some other things that happened before that. Uh, but my heart in the article that went out last week and when it should be going out tomorrow is looking at this event that's going on because it feels like you're watching one of those Left Behind movies, doesn't it? <laughs> right now? It, it It is dramatic. And I'm a sociologist. I majored in sociology and psychology at the People's Republic of Florida State University. So uh, this sort of, of group behavior, you know, uh, fascinates me on the one hand, but it also concerns me because people are, when they need to be acting rationally, are acting quite the opposite. It's hard to get straight scoop on, you know, what's going on, how severe, how, how deadly. And you know, I was Googling the other day. So I, I was supposed to be in Israel, uh, 1st of April. And so just got news... Uh, last night, this morning, uh, that they've shut that you have to self quarantine when you show up now uh, for 14 days, and so uh, we're hoping that passes. Uh, but I mean, just everything that's uh, been shut down and those things, it, because of that, and what I wanted to, to say in that article last week was okay, in this event, it, it seems like an end times type event, 
uh, let's let's assess ourselves. Let's kind of see how we we react to this and kind of uh, project that to what we would do in any tribulation in our life, any big disaster. How we're going to do in regard of our faith, in regard of our mission, and, and first with faith. Uh, so I've got a, a great friend that just keeps me up to date on all the news. Uh, and, and when this uh, virus first was making news in China, uh, it, it was a weekend, it was a Sunday, sa Saturday night, Sunday. He's, he's just sending me article after article after article. I'm reading it. Uh, at the time, I'm home with my daughter who has the flu. Uh, that Monday, So this is Sunday night, I think. I'm reading all this. And Monday, I'm wearing a mask, quarantined at the doctor uh, with the flu uh, myself. And I'm just realizing how easy it is to, to get something. My wife's a school teacher. She says it was just like a wave down the hallway of the school, you know, just kids dropping like flies from class to class to class down the hall. And, you know, seeing that reality, I got I to say, when I first started reading about the virus, fear came over me. And I, I'm not one that gets freaked out about stuff. Uh, you know, I'm here, here in Tornado Alley. I just, I, tornado, I don't worry about that. I, it's, but for some reason, it kind of it gripped me. And I had a lot of travel coming up. and just a lot of things and it really made me think you know when things happen like this in life do we run to faith or do we run to fear what what do we do first and this so that was one of the first things I, I wanted us to assess ourselves with you know as we're hearing this news as it's impacting our lives do, do we run to God do we, we run to what he's already told us and shared to us and revealed to us I mean, I just had a book come out called Invincible, uh, which I was saying, if God's called you to do something, He's you're you're just going to be invincible uh, as He carries out that that calling in your life. And here I was running to fear uh, when I hear the news. And so, for me, and I hope for everybody watching this, I hope we would just kind of assess ourselves and see, okay, in, in this test right here, and it's a real thing, you know, it's, I don't want to downplay that, but uh, what do we run to? Do we run to faith or do we run to fear? Fight or flight, we called it. Yes. In yes. psychology, it's a it's a basic human instinct. You either run toward uh, the threat or you run away from it. Now, uh, it, and there is some justification for an escalation of fear. Uh, and you see these things on social media. There's a whole lot more cases of the flu than there are coronavirus. And more people have died from the flu. Then, okay, that's a fact. Now let's put that in context. I'll make another analogy. Uh, more people die in automobile accidents than they do in airplane accidents. But if an airplane goes down, that makes the news. Well, the survivability uh, of an automobile accident is rel is much larger relative to survivability of a plane crash. Same thing here. A lot of people get the flu, they have it a few days, it goes away. Yes, some people, a lot of people die, but the mortality rate of the coronavirus uh, is, per is perceived as high, and it actually isn't. It's 5%. You've got a 95% chance of contracting the coronavirus and recovering from it. I mean, those are pretty good odds, right? I mean, that's uh, <laughs> well, the, the odds for most things. If there was a ninety-five percent uh, chance that your plane to Israel will not crash, you getting on? <laughs> <laughs> that would, I mean, yeah, you would think about it a little more, but you gotta, you know, when it comes to calling and and you know, they can say that whatever you will about you know my my trip I'm having, but uh, you know, in life when you're called to do something. Uh, you know, especially in your walk with the Lord, and that, that kind of led to my, my the next part was mission. And so we had the flu in our house for like it was like three weeks between my two daughters and myself. And I, I got to be honest, just laying it out there, I, there was very little devotional. Uh, you know, probably should have been with all the sickness going on, but I, we really just kind of let my devotional life fall. Really left all my my ministry stuff just fall. And I mean, I understand you got to take care of yourself and and those things, but you know. When difficulty came, I just began to focus on that and, and not the mission and took my foot off the gas. And, you know, I think, if anything, as believers, I was reading an article uh, today about, I guess, you know, ground zero there uh, in China where this the virus is coming out of. They had people walking the streets preaching uh, where it's, you know, likely illegal to do that and, you know, not the fear of, of contracting this virus and and that's really what we need to do in our mission. When things get more difficult, we need to ramp it up. 
trying to think of an example in the scriptures uh, where we are called to fear instead of be bold. Now we are to fear the Lord, but that word fear is actually not well translated in English. Um, but most of the accounts in the Bible are, are, are of heroic actions in the face of what would normally be a fearsome situation. You know, I find it interesting if we, like if you use Paul as a case study uh, and, and look at what he did. I mean, the first time we see him doing ministry after he's uh, had the experience on the road to Damascus, he's in Damascus, his life is being threatened, they sneak him out. And so he, he, he snuck out, uh, dropped in a basket, uh, lowered from the wall at night so that they won't harm him. Uh, then you see him on some of his journeys. He's he's uh, rushed out of town. He slips out of town. He, he, he just gets out in the right moment. He's protected uh, from those things. But then you see cases such as when he, he comes back from his, his final uh, kind of Mediterranean uh, journey there, and he, he comes back and he uh, knows it's time for him, uh, and he goes just, Right, this this life on the line goes to like downtown, you know, Central Square there, and is arrested boldly. And so you, you see both. And uh, I don't know if you've caught the movie, uh, the Apostle Paul came out a couple years ago. Uh, in in that movie, it's it's showing the church in Rome, the believers in Rome, and they're trying to decide as persecution is sweeping through Rome if they should stay or if they should go. And they send Luke uh, into to the to the prison where Paul's been kept, and they say, you know. Paul, uh, Luke, will you ask Paul on our behalf, what should we do? And in that movie, Paul says, well, sometimes the Lord told me to go left. Sometimes he told me to go right. And I think that's the, you know, a case. And you see that uh, in the life of, of really all the apostles, that they had these times where they, they did, you know, kind of slide out of town. But you had other times where they preached boldly and they rejoiced when they uh, suffered for Christ. And so, you know, I think that's that following in step with the Holy Spirit you know, there's a, t a time that you uh, save yourself to fight for another day, and then that's the hill that you need to die on, and we need to let the Holy Spirit guide us to what which one that is. David comes to mind. There were times yeah, he, when he... He risked <laughs> himself on plenty of hills, didn't he? Well, and there are times when he fled to the hills to find caves to hide in. You know, so, right. um, yes. so fear is a natural part of the human condition uh, yet in the in the uh i think it's in uh second timothy where you know where god says you know uh bring your worries to me because i care for you which presumes by the way that we worry he didn't rebuke us for worrying he said cast your cares upon the lord for he cares for you that presumes that you worry yeah yeah it's it's hard not to, isn't it? I mean, so some some of you listening may be lucky that just things just roll off your back, but uh, then then you have some uh, like myself who it's just an extra struggle that you're going to worry or be anxious about things. You know, my generation and and those some that preceded mine had it pretty easy because we grew up in a culture where our faith was not going to place us in a life threatening uh, position. Uh, like the Christians faced uh, during uh, Caligula's reign as emperor, for example, uh, and others. But there was a time when simply being a Christian uh, was, a, was a crime for which the penalty was death. Um, I, I had to actually counsel my daughter and ask her the question, if there's a, you know, if there's a knife to your throat and says, you know, are you a follower of Jesus Christ or Allah? And what are you going to say when your life's on the line? We never had to had thoughts like that growing up. No, and 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 it never crossed my mind. Even though, you know, in, in my undergrad and seminary, we we talked about Christian history and the persecution went on. It, it wasn't until 2014 and watching on the news what's happening at the hand of, hands of ISIS over in Iraq, there in the Middle East, that. Uh, it really came to the forefront uh, in my life and began to say, okay, this, this is something that's in the, in the world today. I mean, it, it always had been, but it's just crazy how we could practice our faith here in America and, and just realize that that's not something we, we battle with. And, and you know, I, I think exactly what you're saying is 
what really uh, led me to to start stand firm and uh, write my first book, Spiritual Prepper, was uh, so I was going around speaking on that, speaking on you know remaining faithful in the face of persecution and just the you know the marginal challenges that we, we face maybe here, the loss of religious liberty. And my daughter, who was five at the time, uh, the next day, like the Monday, I'm, I'm picking her up from school and she's in the back and she she just says, hey, hey, dad, do you know people are trying to kill Christians? I go, no, you, you were listening uh, last night. And uh, then she begins to say, daddy, why don't Christians just lie when they're asked uh, what they believe? And and I really felt like, you know, in America, we've we just have spent so much time making faith just personal. You know, we're not going to talk about our our faith it's personal it's something just individual i don't have to bring it up i don't have to let it be a an expression i don't have to let it infringe on anybody else it's just a personal thing and that kind of has yielded itself i, I think it, it, in a dangerous way uh because we, we read in scripture if you deny me before men i'll deny you before my father mm -hmm. uh which which i hear i've got some friends that works for voice to the martyrs that they've been in the fields with like uh i think 49 different persecuted groups and they said one of the things they noticed is that those people, those internationals in these persecuted areas take that verse to heart. They believe it. They believe. And I, I think we take it like, yeah, yeah, it says that. But, you know, surely that's not what it really means. And and that's a fear. And, and I actually have an art, the article I have coming out this week through Israel, Islam and the End Times is on meeting together in, in light of the coronavirus. And because I mean, there are going to be practical steps. I, I know there are probably churches that didn't even meet this Sunday. Uh, you know, we were talking with with my my church. You know, what what do we do? How do we handle that? I, I think it's a, a practical, pragmatic possibility and okay for a church that needs to close down so that you know people aren't getting sick. I, I see that, and that's thank goodness for technology like you use that are able to do stuff in settings like that. But at the same time, I think we also have this opinion in America that meeting together and getting not in the institution, not say in a place with the steeple but just meeting together with other believers is not that big a deal or not that important and it is and uh and so my my concern my warning i wanted to give even though we may can close the institution uh down uh for times of, of sickness like this maybe at the same time uh we, we need to still value meeting together and we can't let that fall to the wayside says the man who is uh running a highly digitized church um a couple of minutes left uh you have just uh, come back from nrb 2020 tell us about that yeah national religious broadcasters uh convention uh went to promote the upcoming children's book and uh i tell you it's just amazing i mean people i mean you know how it is and you know i, I think it's a situation with every guest that you have uh the lord is leading them somewhere in their life uh, to carry out a mission, carry out ministry, whatever that is, and uh, to, to do that. And it's a challenge. You know, if it's not something already established and you're just following in line when you're stepping out in a visionary type role, uh, I think when we get into gifting kind of this apostleship role where you're, you're leading in, in vision, uh, it's difficult. And, and really like ever, so you've got broadcasters, the main audience, and so you have anybody from people who own radio stations, to uh, DJs, to uh, podcasters, I mean, just all kinds of, and then you have people promoting their ministries. There's this crazy connection, and just, you know, person after person you meet, their story and what God's leading them to do, I mean, just powerful. I mean, I, I made a great friend who's who feels called to start an orphanage there, and he was there rallying support for this large orphanage, uh, and orphanage is not the right word, but foster home uh, system that he is uh, creating. I met a uh, broadcaster in the, the small country of, uh, of Togo. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, like 8 million people. He's the only Christian radio station. Uh, they carry soccer games and all these things, and they're just reaching people like that. I mean, just just amazing. I had the chance to just uh, spend a lot of time with a, a, a gentleman who uh, had a whole film career and left it to uh, shoot, a, shoot a video on Israel and understanding how we should – uh, understand Israel and just you know story after story after story I uh, like that and it's beautiful you know I mean it encourages that you're not the only crazy one out there um, and then and then you just gotta lament kind of the difficult stories you know uh, but and, and the divine appointments uh, you, you were just at North Carolina Writers Conference right yes uh, which I am like I hate it I, I get so so jealous when I see the pictures I mean so many great people 
uh, there, but it's the same type of thing. Those divine appointments, mm -hmm. uh, holy introductions. I mean, all that connection and seeing God work and bring people together. You, you, you know, it's it's we kind of can get that Elijah moment where we just think we're the only one, and then you show up something like that, and it's like getting to the cave where everybody's hid. You know, all the other prophets are hid. Uh, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, but a, a big part of it was was uh, something that you've been at the forefront of is the NRB began in the '40s to uh, lobby to keep religious broadcasting on TV. That the main stations were were shutting that down, uh, and now they're shifting their attention to in the digital space that's controlled really by a few private companies how do we uh keep religious i mean how do we keep the message out there how do we do that and so that was a lot of what was being talked about um and i guess the big deal i got to uh, take part in a um it was a, a banquet uh for ministries working with israel and what god is doing there and that restoration is just amazing now where was this conference held it's in Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee. Yep, yep. About, right, get out right before the tornado. Okay. How, about how many people there? Hi, it's several thousand. Uh, several, it, it was only a few times you see everybody together. Uh, I don't know the number, but I three or four thousand probably. So you must have been like a kid in the candy store. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean it was great. I mean it was, you know, and and the thing is, I, I went on a mission to promote my thing. And uh, and that's a terrible mindset. And that's what I, I love about the like the uh, serious writer group you're involved in, North Carolina Writing Conference. Those things. It's not a just about your thing. It's about you know how can you help one another uh, get their thing out there. And that was just a reminder uh, midweek. And it just you know once once you get in the groove of that and just connecting with people, it's just amazing to see what God's doing. It is. Well, Jake, you, you, you're living the life, and uh, now you'll be in Israel um, in about a month, huh? Yeah, so it, amazing thing. So uh, it's, it's there for the Passover. It is, and so I'm, I'm part of a new church plant locally. You were in the digital church uh, also, but uh, locally. And dumb me, I just didn't even think about it. Uh, you, know, a, you know, when you start in January, Easter's a big thing for this new church plant. And I scheduled this trip to Israel because as a pastor, no one ever asks you to do anything at Easter. You just don't have to worry about that date. Uh, but it's the Passover. But we're going there uh, not just to do a tour, but to be part of a revival service on the Sea of Galilee uh, for Messianic believers, which is a, a just an amazing thing. And so praying the doors open and we can travel there. All right. Well, as you can tell, we got somebody knocking on the door. I bet that's Dale Didway. So I guess we better wrap it up. We stayed a couple minutes extra. Jake, you know, it's great. Uh, thanks for helping us out once a month, coming on, just sharing your walk. Uh, in your case, probably your run. <laughs> but anyway, it, uh, keep it going and uh, can't wait to hear from you. Well, I guess next time we hear from you, you'll be in Israel. Hope so. Hopefully, okay. Hope the travel ban lifts. If not, uh, <laughs> be here so all right well whatever it is we'll deal with it jake you're a great guy appreciate you being part of the team and uh, sharing with us and thanks for well staying healthy and not stocking up on toilet paper <laughs> well i i, I we're, we're gonna have a healthy amount because uh we don't want to be at without so oh, I, uh, I, I, <laughs> so if you think we're throwing some punches it's gonna be in the toilet paper aisle not the lysol aisle but. there you go all right well go for it jake appreciate you all stopping right. in man uh, have fun yeah, thank all you right. and and uh, Dale, look forward to hearing from you. All right, brother. Take care. All right, Jake McCandless, and he has got it right here on pjnet.tv. Jake joins us uh, once a month, and that would be the second Tuesday of every month about this time. We have got to get the studio ready for Dale Didway, and I will leave you with two questions. Number one, what is the boldest thing you've ever done for Jesus Christ? Number two. When was that? It is my hope and our challenge that we never be satisfied with either answer. <laughs>